Welcome to our Palm Sunday Act of Worship here in the St Aldhelm's Benefice. Let's begin with the sound of distant bells, the bells of Worth, ringing a few months ago on a misty afternoon. Monday afternoon uh, a few weeks ago. We're going to be following an order of service for Palm Sunday and I'm going to call it up on the screen now. So if you wish to you can follow the liturgy. Grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we've come together this day in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word and to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins. That by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion now and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and in faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you our God. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. And the Collect for today. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender mercy towards the human race sent to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer upon the cross. Father, that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we'll have our Bible reading, which for this Palm Sunday is from Matthew, and it tells the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they've come near Jerusalem and have reached Bethphage 
at the Mount of, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfil what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him that followed of him and that followed were shouting Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? The crowd was saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes, you have. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. He left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. So, some thoughts on that passage, and indeed our current situation. For Jesus, when he set out on that journey down from the Mount of Olives into the valley that led up towards Jerusalem, it was a carefully planned occasion. Nothing had been left to chance. What he was doing was a deliberate and a provocative political act. And he chose the donkey to enact the prophecy that we find in Zechariah speaks of a Messiah riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey. Matthew makes the point that the crowd was very large. It's interesting that this crowd probably were the crowd that had followed Jesus from Galilee. They were not a Jerusalem crowd. They were in Jerusalem, but they were Jesus' followers and supporters. And they spread their cloaks on the ground and strew paths in his palms. This was a, a royal celebration. The crowd was very different from another smaller crowd that was to gather the next day, what we call Good Friday, when Pilate cynically washed his hands in his populist mini referendum the crowd shouted for Jesus to die. Not the same crowd, a different crowd. As the crowd welcomes Jesus and they go down the hill into the valley and then up towards Jerusalem, they sing great psalms of praise. And these are the psalms of praise that we find in Psalm 118, for example that were sung when pilgrims made their way towards Jerusalem. And the words were, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a hymn of praise to the God who defeats his foes and establishes his just kingdom. And Jesus comes in the fulfilment of his nation's hopes, or at least in the hopes of the crowd that are welcoming him. Not everyone was to welcome him in the way they did. 
crowd are longing for a king who will bring peace to earth from heaven itself. And then Jesus enters the temple and the mood changes dramatically. Riding on the donkey, we suddenly we find Jesus now angry and engaging the money changes. <laughs> What's happening here? Here we have another deliberate and provocative act. This time angry and disruptive, Jesus overturning those tables. Why? This was what Jesus intended to do when he entered into Jerusalem. It was all part of the plan. The temple had become in some ways, Herod's vanity project. And uh, when I think of Herod, I can't help thinking of a sort of Trump caricature saying something like, I'll build you the best temple ever. No one will, let, no one will ever build a better temple than me. Make Jerusalem great again. That may be unfair to Herod. But the temple had come in many ways to represent all that was wrong with the nation. This was a nation that was called to represent God to the world, and yet... As a nation, Israel had bowed the knee to nationalism, to wealth, to power, to privilege, to violence. Idols that, in many ways, had corrupted Israel's identity and its vocation. And the temple represented this. It represented a subversion of Israel's calling to be a people who would bless the nations and reveal God's creativity, God's beauty to the world. Rather than doing that, it become associated with damage to God's reputation. Through the worship, through the systems that are developed, through Israel's stepping away from its calling, God's name had not been honoured, it had not been hallowed. That was the task of the people of God, to hallow God's name, that God's name would be honoured amongst the other nations, and yet God's name had been brought into disrepute, and Jesus is angry. And his protest brought the temple system to a grinding halt, a fleeting moment perhaps of enforced Sabbath. Business as usual momentarily stopped. protests of the uh, Extinction Rebellion come to mind here, symbolically stopping the City of London for a moment as a prophetic act. Business as usual stopped. A judgment has been delivered by Jesus. Judgment on Jerusalem, on the temple system, and not, as many would have expected, on the foreign foe, Rome. The judgment begins the house of God, as the prophet Samuel revealed. There is or was an opportunity here for people to reflect, for the religious authorities, the secular authorities, which were one of the same thing in Jesus' time, the governing authorities, secular wasn't a concept they had. Um, 
for a change of heart, for repentance. But it was not to be heeded. And as we know, God's prophet would, the following day, be executed brutally on a Roman cross. Because nothing must come in the way of the temple business. Nothing must halt the nation's vested interests or stand in its way. Anything that does stand in its way must be removed. Jesus had previously wept over Jerusalem, wept over his people, because he foresaw the disaster that was looming if they continued in the way in which things were going. If they continued to bow the knee at the idol of a violent nationalistic aspiration, it would lead to a devastating conflict with Rome. And the temple would be destroyed and the city ruined and the society that Jesus knew would become unravelled. Unless the leaders of Israel, unless society, turned from pursuing a broad and careless path that would lead to the city's destruction. Tragically, many continue to eschew Jesus' way of peace and they betrayed their nation's vocation, abandoning the way of blessing, the way of generosity, the way of peace, the way of creation care that Jesus modelled to them and revealed to them as their true calling. And in do so doing, stepping away from Jesus calling on them to turn to repent there would be a price to pay so to that which shall not be named COVID-19 we stand at a moment when business as usual has been put on hold by this very 21st century virus is it possible that this is one of those defining moments of choice facing our society, indeed the world? A grim moment of sadness and loss and dislocation, a time of lament, certainly, but also a time of cleaner air, of cleaner waterways, an unprecedented and unimagined fall in air travel, a pause in the processes of climate change, a moment perhaps of surprising community cohesion, an unforeseen enforced Sabbath. Will the world, will we return to business as usual in a few months time, heedless of the harm our economic systems are causing to our planet, with their unsustainable pressures on habitats and ecosystems? Will we return heedless to an increasingly individualistic society? So what might it look for us to realise our prophetic role as disciples of the risen Messiah at this time? That is, the inheritance of the Church. We are called to heed the signs of the times in a way in which many in Jesus' own society failed to do. What I wonder might it mean for us, the Church, to put our trust in Jesus and the narrow, challenging and countercultural way of truth and life he held out to his own people and continues to hold out to us, us the inheritors of the vocation of those called to bless the earth and bring honour to God. Will our responses, will our actions, Hallow God's name, that God's name may be seen and praised. Hallowed indeed. A challenge for me. A challenge, I suggest, for us all. And now a poem. This is a poem that has been written by Lynn Unger in March this year. It's 
titled Enforced Sabbath. What have you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now on trying to make the world more different than it is. Sing, pray, touch on those, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Centre down. When your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your hearts, reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. Back now to our order of service. The Creed, our statement of faith and understanding of who we are and what we're called to be. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we pray. In these strange and dark and disturbing times. We pray for all those who are suffering loss through the COVID-19 virus. We pray for those mourning loved ones taken away unexpectedly. We pray for those anxious about friends and relatives in intensive care at this time. We pray for those who are all who are suffering the effects of isolation at this time. And we pray for our medical professionals, for the scientists, for our government. We give thanks for the compassion and care of the doctors and nurses and many involved in the NHS at this time. Thank you for their blessing. We pray for them. Lord, we pray for ourselves, that we may respond wisely to this time. We may use this time to reassess priorities and to ponder your call on our lives. Trusting in you, Lord, that you will enable your people to continue bring praise to your name and tell your story of rescue, love and forgiveness. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praises into one as our Saviour has taught us, so together we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you. And we'll share the peace in the using the... Um, the sign language, gesture of peace. Peace be with you.
Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves and to take up the cross and to follow him, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and for always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. So thank you for joining us today. I hope that by now you will have received a palm cross dropped on your um, doorstep or put through your letterbox if you haven't. Hopefully one will be coming your way soon. One of the things I forgot to do this morning um, was to pray a blessing over the, uh, the palm crosses. I'm going to do it now. Um, a retrospective blessing for all those crosses that have gone out already. So Father God, we Thank you for this symbol of your faithfulness towards your people. And we pray that where these crosses are displayed, there your blessing will remain. And those who cast their eyes upon them will be reminded of your faithfulness and drawn in to the story of your people, the people called to hallow your name. Amen. Plenty of things happening during the course of the week, so emails will come round with those as we pass through Holy Week in anticipation of Easter Day. Every blessing be with you. Good night.